Well, Pastor's right. He hadn't. He didn't let me share it. I've had churches call me and want me to go share this testimony, but it was for such a time as today. Um, it's not very easy to get up here and talk about the experience that I had. Some people think you're crazy. You know, they say all kinds of things. But I know that what happened to me was real. I know that I experienced something. And because of it, God has a mandate on my life to stand up here and tell you about what happened. I got to just tell you about my Jesus real quick. He saved my life. And I was with Pastor Sue in the prayer. We were in the pastor's office praying. And I just started thinking about one year ago, today, 365 days ago, I experienced death. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, with all my heart, that I crossed into eternity. I know that something happened. The body knows things. And in those moments, I knew my body was shutting down. And it was over. And so I think about Jesus and why he saved my life. I guess it's to talk about it today to you and to tell other people about my experience. It's not easy, but who am I if I don't say what God has mandated me to say? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you, God. Father, I ask that you would take me out of the way, God, and you would share this testimony just as it happened by the spirit of truth. No words added, no words taken away. Lord, only to bring you glory and glory to you alone. This is not about a man. This is not about me. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving power and to tell people that there is a hell And that hell is real. It's as real as I'm standing up here today. Hell is real. And God, I pray that you would interject into the people's hearts the truth about your word. I pray that you would articulate the substance of God through your word. That you would penetrate hearts and help us to come to the realization, Father, of the truth of your word and the attributes of who you are. Father, this service we give to you, Holy Spirit. This is your time, O Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It's all right if I get free a little while. Amen. I tell you, uh, I had Miss Belinda come over and she ironed my shirt. What I didn't know was that I was going to get hugged by 100 people. And now I'm all wrinkled up. But how many of y'all know this is a church where the Spirit of God, where love exists. And that's what kept me through the years. You see, I'd come to know the Lord about nine years ago. Actually, Pastor Butch took me to a service at the Brownsville Revival. Anybody ever heard of Brownsville? Where Pastor Stephen, Reverend Stephen Hill, was preaching a message. Uh, I said I was actually 1999, July the 2nd. I was on my way to a place called the Home of Grace. See, I had been despounded and away. I had gone out on a binge that had taken me seven days and everybody was looking for me, and, and uh, basically, I, I was at the point of death, and I met this man. And one day, three people told him the name Kevin Ray. And he said, Lord, are you telling me something? Do I need to go? So he actually sought me out. They had the cell group, and they set this whole thing up for me. <laughs> it was like the cell group, and it was, it was all about me coming And let me tell you, that's what the Lord will do. The Lord will sing you out because he loves you so much. So Pastor Butch took me to the Brownsville Revival, and something happened to me that day. I know that I had an awakening. Something happened. There was a transformation July the 2nd. The year was 1999, and I went on to go to the home of grace and to go to other places beyond that. Let me tell you something. Just because you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that does not ensure that you're going to make it to heaven. That does not ensure that you're going to get off of drugs. That does not ensure that you're going to quit sinning and live in the way that you were living. I had an experience. I had an encounter with Christ at that uh, Brownsville revival and then even went to the home of grace and after that even fell back 
into drugs after being clean for about five months, something to that effect. And that pattern had gone on for years. Pastor Butch wasn't lying when he said I, he lost his hair because of me. And, uh, I mean, there's been times that he's actually come and, and scooped me from places that I could have been seriously injured and died. Come to my rescue many times, and, and I really appreciate it. And I just would want to honor them right now because of their obedience to Jesus. Let me tell you something. To deal with a drug addict is not easy. To deal with somebody that's doing the wrong thing over and over and over and over, it's not an easy thing to continue to go after them. But they never quit and they never gave up on me. And they gave me the very thing that was going to ultimately bring me to the point that I was going to get set free. And it's called the Word of God. These are the ministers of the Word of God. And they hope when I couldn't hope for me. And they hope for people, and that's what God's asking from us, that we would hope for other people. Drug addiction is not easy to deal with. And so I've gone, I went through this pattern over and over. I'd get clean for a while. I'd get clean for six months, and then I'd fall for six months. I'd get clean, and then I would fall. And then I would get clean, and then I would fall. I would have people's hopes up in me. People would say, this guy has got potential. He can do some things. I see something about him. And they would put everything they had in me, and then I would fall disappoint them. I was even at one point working with the youth in this church. I was, I was preaching and teaching the word of God. We were going out to LSU. I was standing up on a wall at LSU preaching the gospel. Great things were happen, happening, and then I fell. We had a fired up youth group that loved, loved Jesus, and then the shepherd fell. The Bible says the hireling, he's going to run when the wolf comes. But how many of y'all know there was a reason for that? And today I know the reason. The Bible says that, that we overcome the wicked one. We overcome Satan when the word of God lives in us. and We become strong. And you see, because I was entangled in so much darkness and, and the depths of the addiction was so deep that the capacity of God's word that I needed needed to be more. I needed more. I really needed to sit under the word for a long period of time, but I was not willing to do that. Thank God for, for people that, that stuck with me throughout that time. So I went on that cycle, and, the, and I remember the last time uh, when I was very involved in the church and I had fallen, that was so hard to bear, to know that God was using you and that even the ones that you were ministering to, and they were looking to you as the hope, that alone broke my heart. And four years, I stayed out using drugs, getting on, getting off, trying my best. Y'all, I didn't want to live like that. I didn't want to live on it. Who wants to be a slave to something? Who wants something? Look, I love my children. I love my wife. I don't want them to grow up with a daddy that's way. I don't want people saying things about their daddy. It was breaking my heart, but I didn't know how to stop. I didn't know how to quit. I wanted to stop. I remember one time I was in, my, in my, my trailer where I used to live, and I was thinking about, God, why won't you deliver me? And I was so angry, and I picked up the whole counter. I, was so, I had so much strength. I was so angry. I was so mad because I wanted to be delivered. With everything in me, I wanted to get off of drugs. I wanted to get off of cocaine. I wanted to stop thinking the way I was thinking. Because I was believing a lie. How many of y'all know Jesus is merciful? I'm telling you, his mercy will triumph over judgment. His mercy will triumph. The Bible says where sin abounds, his grace abounds much more. And I'm humbled today by his grace. I'm humbled today when I look back and see that a year has passed me today. A year has passed and I am still standing for Jesus. And his grace, y'all, his grace. I'm telling you about a power. I'm telling you about a grace. It's his power. And I'm telling you, I, I mean, I've tried everything. I've tried AA. I've tried all avenues of psychology. You, like, you name it, philosophy, 
whatever. Y'all don't, y'all don't realize I have gone all over the country. I've been to Canada, to Georgia, to Florida, to Mississippi. I, if they said that they could help me, I was on a plane going to another treatment. If, if there was any glimpse, my wife would stay up at night on the Internet researching places because she loved me. And I'm telling you, just that, no woman could have bared without the power of God manifested on her, there is no person could have bared the extremities of pain that she went through. And when I look back, that humbles me. Y'all want to know who the real hero is? Jesus, through her, I know what beyond a shadow of a doubt I'd be dead today if she didn't stay. She didn't stick with me. People would tell her, you need to leave him. Look what he's doing to you. Look what he's doing to your children. But she held on. She had a hope in her heart. I'm telling you that. That's supernatural. So I'd gotten to a point where nothing was working. And this last stint, uh, about a year ago, the only person I would talk to was my cousin Will. He was the only person I would talk to. I had quit, I, I mean, I had gotten to a point where I didn't even want to hear the word of God anymore. Because you know what? It's not working. I've tried it. It's not working. So me and Will grew up together. We'd figure out every one of life's problems together. We'd sit around and ex- talk about how we're going to become millionaires and share our dreams and all this stuff. But... So anyway, I, I'd gotten to the point, and, and I just, I remember this time, and I remember Will was calling me, because I, I don't know if he knew that something was wrong, but I, I, he, he was calling, he was calling, he was calling, and I was out on a binge, y'all, with an obscene amount of drugs, and really it was my death wish, it was my, my suicide, is almost what it, what it looks like now when I was, I was planning my suicide, because you know what? I'd become a prostitute of cocaine. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be like that. But it had complete control over me. When I thought about my life, when I thought about the things that I'd done, when I thought about the pain that I caused, I couldn't bear it anymore. So I escaped through that. And even that wasn't working anymore. So I just thought I would keep using, keep using, keep using. And I had an ounce of, of drugs, and, I, and I'd gone off for two or three days. And I remember coming to this point uh, in my living room at my home where, I, I, y'all, it, I, I don't know how the human body can ingest so much poison and live. Because I had ingested so much poison. And I remember being on that, in, that, in the living room that day uh, on the sofa, and it had been, I had been gone up for two days. And I had done so much of these drugs, it was just incredible. And I remember, Jean wouldn't want me to, she wouldn't want me to come in the house with drugs because my kids were there. But I would come and I would hide them because I was an addict. That's what addicts do. Addicts are in bondage to it. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be like that. But that's what was happening. So I remember this time, I, and, and Jean was, she had gotten up to check on me, and uh I was laying on the sofa, and she just, I guess she chalked it off as, he's, I don't know what to do. He's messed up again. He's out of it again. And um, the moments to come were both tormentive and glorious. As I sat and and wallowed in the pain. It was like something was telling my, something was telling me, just keep doing it, keep doing it. And you understand, I was a professional drug user. I knew how much to do. But this voice kept edging me to continue. And I remember that voice just as clear as it is today. And when I did it, The moment I did it, I I, I totally blacked out. I was a drug user for 19 years. I never had one blackout, 
Not one time did I ever black out using a substance. And when I blacked out, I immediately went into another, what I believe to be another dimension. Now, my body was on the sofa at the time that I did it. And, but when, when, what I remember was when I went into the other dimension, I was running through walls. It, was like t- it had to be like 10 walls. And as I was running, my face was hit like fl- flopping into these walls. And I, I, didn't, I, I didn't understand. I didn't know what was going on. But the next thing that happened, when I opened my eyes, John was standing in the, in the I was standing up, and she was standing in the, the, uh, the casement of the bathroom. And when I looked upon her face, when I looked into her eyes, I knew I was in trouble. And then again, I went out again. I think she, I don't know if I collapsed, uh, but she escorted me to the, to the bedroom. Uh, this, this all went on about 30 minutes before the ambulance came, and I'm going to tell you kind of the testimony before the ambulance came because there were things that happened. Basically, I kind of went in and out. I was going in and out. And let me just say this. What I'm telling you today is not uncommon. I researched this, and there are so many people who have had this experience. I, th- the way that I put this testimony together I put it together before I even researched. It's basically the people are saying the same thing. And I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about professional people. I'm talking about doctors and professionals and CP. Professional people can attest to this, to this dimension or to this, you know, I've heard so many people talk about the out-of-body experience. But anyway, um, John had me and I had gone, this is what I call, Oh, I believe to be the threshold of death. After that, after, she, after I fell in, in her arms in the bedroom, I immediately, have, has anybody ever seen the, the movie uh, uh, Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore and how the, the shadows came around the bad guy and he like took him down? I mean, that's exactly what happened to me. Exactly. And, and it was like four shadows. Now, all the while, she's looking into my eyes, and my eyes are open, but they're not blinking. To, I, I researched to be clinically dead means that your heart stops beating and you stop breathing. And that happened to me. I believe I had cardiac arrest at that moment. Of course, there's no doctors that can attest to that, but I know what I believe in my heart. I know what, I mean, you know your body will tell you what, what's going on. And so I see these four shadows and they, they come and get me and they take me down into this. It's like a tunnel. It's like a, it's like a shaft and the walls are like clay, but they're like stone as well. And I remember on the, it was a descent. It was just like being in an airplane and you feel the gravity. You feel yourself going down. It was exactly the same. And and with the, you know how the force you feel when you're on a plane? That's how it felt when I was going down. And with their fingers, these demons had power over me. Just with their fingers. They didn't even put their hands on me. They just like moved a finger and they had control over my spirit, man. And as I'm going down this tunnel, I mean, I know what's going on. I've heard people testify and say they didn't know what was going on. They were confused. But you see, I had known the word of God. I had had an experience. I know the word. I knew what the scripture said about heaven and hell. So I was not exempt. I was not confused. I knew what was going on. And for some reason, the whole way down this tunnel, I'm preaching the word of God. I'm preaching the scriptures. It's still coming out of me in eternity. The word of God was still alive in eternity. The word of God was, the only thing you can take from planet earth is God's word that's written in your heart. It's the only thing that's going to make eternity. You know, they talk about you can't take your money, you can't take your riches. But it's the wealthiest thing you can have is God's word. Amen? I love God's word. But at that moment, it was as if I gained a new understanding. 
There are capacities in eternity that you can't parallel to the temporal world or to the, to the earth. And, and this is what I mean. Your, your capacity of, fee, of feeling, you're 10 times smarter. Your senses are so much more acute. I just knew things. Nobody had to tell me what was going on. I knew things that were, were happening without any, it was like I gained a new wisdom. It's, it's like uh, the, the Hebrew, the Greek language, to the English, English language, the Hebrew language has so many more words. There are more colorful dictations uh, as a parallel to the English language. In other words, the word love in the English language, it's interpreted with seven different words in the Greek language. So it's like that in eternity. There are so many more capacities for understanding. And so as I'm going down this tunnel, I'm telling you guys, great horror filled my being. Have y'all ever saw the movie Awake? Has anybody ever saw that movie Awake where the guy is, is on the operating table and they're like planning his death and he, he's laying out and, and the doctors are like planning his death. But for some reason, he never fell out of unconsciousness. He knew what was going on. And he's like, he's trying to scream, but he's because he's under the anesthesia, he can't do anything. He's just like, please, please, please. He's trying to get somebody's attention, and that's how I felt. I'm, I'm wanting to get somebody's attention. I know what's happening. I know what's going on. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking about my wife, and I'm trying to get her attention. And I'm also thinking, she's going to think that I'm in heaven. She's because I knew the word of God. She's going to think that I'm in heaven. So these demons take me into this, for lack of a better way to say it, it looked like a chamber. It looked like a like probably a 20 by 20, maybe like a holding cell of some sort with the walls being stoned, clayish, but ironish. I, it was like a substance I've never seen before. And I remember it was like I had chains on me and I was put on display for the enemy. It's like I was being made fun of. Uh, getting ready to be made a mockery of. I didn't see the chains, but I felt them. And there was something that had my hands bound to the wall. And in, in that moment, I remember feeling such great despair and hopelessness. I miss God. There is no God in hell. There is no God in this place, this chamber. There was no evidence of love. There was no love anywhere. There was no hope. No hope. Just, just, just to think that you can get a, a moment of rest in the earth. You, you don't even understand how incredible that is, that you have an inclination of hope. Because you see, I lived as a drug addict. I thought there was no hope. I thought I was living in hell. But just being separated from God in this dark, dark place, that alone, I can't. It's like I just know something. I, have, I understand eternity. I do. I really do. It's seated in my heart because of this experience. I know about I know what it's going to feel like. I know how someone is going to feel when they go to hell. I understand it. I know it. And it's an incredible burden to carry, to know that. And because of it, it's caused me everywhere I go, it's almost like a, it's almost like a curse. Because everywhere I go, I got to tell somebody about Jesus. I got to tell them about hell, that hell is real. I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a store or if I go to Walmart, if I go anywhere, I'm just thinking about people. John's talking to me, and I'm looking at the waitress, thinking about how I'm going to approach her about Jesus and how I'm going to tell her about this hell that I was in, that I know and that I saw. You see, I'm responsible for that. No, it's not easy. It's not easy at times. It's uncomfortable for me to tell somebody to bring Jesus up to somebody who is not wanting to hear that. There's a place for that, they say. There's a church. We go to church and hear that. But you see, I know something. And woe is me if I don't say what I know. If I don't tell them that hell is real and that Jesus Christ paid the price for sin and you don't have to go to hell for your sin. Let me tell you, sin 
It doesn't matter what degree. Just one, if you lived your life on this earth and you told one lie that you did not repent and get set free from, you're going to hell. If you did not receive the Savior, Jesus Christ, into your heart. And let me tell you something. You know when you have Jesus. There's no denying. One of my, one of my, one of my opening lines I say in my, in my approaches to people is, Hey, my brother, do you know Jesus? And if they say, well, uh, no. <laughs> they don't know him. <laughs> they don't know him. Don't know. Let me tell you something. If somebody knows Jesus, they're like, hallelujah, I know him. I know Jesus. I know him. I know him. He's the love of my life. Yeah. You see, once you've experienced Jesus, there's no turning back. There's no excuse to know him is to love him. If you know him, you will love him. And because of that love, that great love, it will catapult you to do things. <laughs> Sometimes that seems a little strange, y'all. That's what happened to me. I've been smeared by the love of God. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm crazy like this. So I'm in this place. I'm in this chamber, and I'm, and I'm, too, I'm stuck to the wall. And I remember thinking this thought that there are going to be people here that didn't expect they were going to come here. You see, the scripture says the way to heaven is narrow, but the way to hell is broad. I heard Dr. Lester Summerall say he had a vision of people on an interstate. And he said they were falling off the interstate and they were falling into hell. How many of y'all know Dr. Lester Summerall? Great man of faith, great man of God. And in this vision, he's like, Lord, they're falling and they're going into hell. Well, we can't. He says, it's your fault. It's your fault. You know something that you need to tell them. And so Dr. Lester Summerall, one of the greatest men of faith in these last days, I mean, he's had an incredible ministry. But anyway, it's our responsibility to tell them. And, and so I'm there, and I'm, I'm thinking, that, man, people are going to be here. And I, got, I got so many thoughts going through my mind. It, it's just the things that happened to me just in I, I think it was two minutes. It could have been, it could have been a second. I don't know. It could have been, we, we calculated two minutes because Jean was on the other, and she kind of told me her side of the story, and so we put it together as it was a two-minute thing. Dr. Eby, has anyone ever heard of Dr. Eby? Dr. Eby had an experience where he had two minutes in hell, and basically... He saw the same thing that I saw, the chamber. See, I didn't see flames. I've, I've heard a lot of testimonies about people that saw the flames of hell. People saw the screams. I heard one testimony where these scientists were in, I think it was either Moscow, some part of Russia, and what they were doing was they were, they were dropping microphones down into the earth to see how the settlement, how the, uh, the earth would make, you know how the earth shifts? And so they're researching, and I, I don't remember how many feet it was, but they, I mean, it was like miles. They dropped this microphone, nine miles, John said. Nine miles, they dropped the microphone, and it's recorded the screams. They believe it's the screams of the dam. I was going to play the video, but for time restraints, I didn't do it. But you talk about an incredible, incredible video, and you, you, you just know things that are, I really felt in my spirit that was truth. You, you know, you get a sense of, of what's truth and what's not truth, and to me, that felt like it was truth. Uh, but, I mean, these were professional people. I don't know why they would make that up. But I heard the video, and it is quite an incredible um, experience. So, anyway, I'm, I'm in this place. You know, I could see my skin just like I had skin. I had a body, just like I had a body. But my skin was translucent. It was like, it was like invisible, but it wasn't. You could, you could still see it. It had substance, but you could see through it. It, it was it was. It's hard to explain. I mean, it's just no words to explain. But I remember on the wall, I could see inside of my, my belly right here. This is where your soul is. I believe your soul is right here. And in this area, there was a great dark. It was just dark. It was black. It was like a blackish gray color that was right here. And I knew what it was. It was sin. It was filth. And you see, because of that filth I had on me, 
That's what gave Satan's devils, Satan's demons, the right to come and get me. It was the contract agreement that I made with the devil that I agree with him and disagree with God, even though I knew God's word. Because I held on to sin, that's the sin of omission. I held on to sin, omission. I'm saying, God, no to you, and yes to my way, to my sin. And that darkness right here gave Satan legal right to put me in that place of torment. I just knew that. I was darkened. In my soul, I was darkened. Wow. Man, we can't play with sin. It's not worth it. Since that, since that experience, since that, since that revelation, man, I, I'm on guard. I don't let anything come in these eyes or ears. And if it does, I get it right quick because I don't play with sin. Because all it takes is a little leaven, a little bit to contaminate my whole body. And that's how we need to be as Christians. We need to be vigor. We need to be fervent. And we need to stand for righteousness and stand for what's right. Because let me tell you, there is a lost and dying generation out there that is going to hell. And they need to see something real in us that's going to make them want to come to Jesus. And let me tell you something. I had people watch me and look at me for years to profess Christ and then to go back out in the streets. And they said, I knew that stuff wasn't real. I knew it. Jesus stuff. Because we, as Christians ought to carry the mantle of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to carry it and wear it right and wear it well because so many years we haven't done it right. And we've given them a, a false Christ. And we've, we've showed them things that are, that are not who our God is. My God is a God of love and compassion. And he has power to set me free from sin. And we need to see him for who he is. And people need to see us and see him living in us for who he is. I felt this presence come up to me while I'm in this place. And it was the presence of sin. Now listen to this. In this moment on the wall, there was something breathing on me. And I have never felt so filthy in all my life. The smell. There's no way I could describe to you the smell, the filth, every AIDS, sin, cancer, perversion, child pornography, every evil thing that you could imagine in your mind that man has imagined was alive and it was breathing on me. It had its being. It was alive in hell, was ready to consume me. You see, the, I had pain in my heart. I just feel like I need to say this right now. I had pain that came into me as a, as a child. I had trauma in my heart that was never dealt with. And that pain of abuse caused me to go all the way to the place of hell. Let me tell you all something. It's very serious that we allow the Lord to heal us of our pain because that pain, the very thing that Satan put on you will take you back to his place. Because you see, that pain is, is the doorway to his entrance in your life and ultimately to take you to this place called hell. So this, this being was breathing on me, and I remember feeling so filthy. And in a moment, while this thing is happening to me, I feel like God allowed me to feel this pain, guys, that I could not describe. If I tried, I couldn't exaggerate what I felt because there are no words to, to describe the pain that I felt in this moment. I could literally feel between, I could feel, you know where the toe cheese is in your toes? I could literally feel between my toes, I was hurting everywhere, all over my body. I could, I could become one with my hair follicles. I, could, I was hurting so bad. It was like a fire was on me. I did not see a fire. I didn't see a flame. 
But guys, I was in so much pain. I remember, God, I was thinking about my ki- when I was having kidney stones and, and how painful those are. But it was a thousand times painful, more painful than a million times more painful. I can't even describe to you. It was like if someone was ripping flesh off of your body. It was like as if you were dipped into acid. Has anybody ever had acid exposed on their skin? And that wouldn't do it no justice. For a moment, I felt this incredible burning all over my body, the sensation like I've never experienced in this world, the pain of hell. My God, if that's what's waiting in hell, if that is really what the the end of the people that say no to God, oh, my God, my God, help us, please, Lord. I I was really shocked to see God as a God of judgment because I've only known him as a God of mercy and love. I've only known him, I've only knew him to be good. I've never seen the judgment side of God, that God is going to judge sin and that it's going to be very painful. Words of uncomfortability, that's, that's not even it. It's so much far beyond un- being uncomfortable. It is torment. It is torment. Torment everlasting. It will never end. It will never cease. Imagine your friends being in this place, your loved ones, the people that you, you love with all of your heart, yourself. Imagine those that are dear to you. Being in this place, you know, I look at people, and that's the, when somebody dies, it's the first thing I think about. I can't get it out of my mind. All I think about is heaven and hell. That's it. Bar none. That, that's all I'm interested in for my personal life is that I'm going to make heaven, and that I'm going to bring as many people as I can with me. Because let me tell you something. I believe the heart of the Father The heart of the Lord Jesus Christ is that not one person would ever go to that place. He doesn't wish that any one of us go there. You see, hell was made for the devil and his angels, the scripture declares. It wasn't made for us. God created us to love us. He created us for us to love him. And those that say no to God, there's a place called hell. And I tell you, it scares me really scares me. The Bible says in Psalm 16, 3, the sorrow of death compassed me and the pain of hell got a hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. This is in the Bible. Seems like some, some of the patriarchs experienced something like what I experienced. The Bible declares that there are different levels of hell. I believe that. I was in this holding cell, and I I really believe that there was more to come. I I was not in the the fullness of time. I was just, I couldn't have handled anymore. God couldn't have gave me more. I would have, it would have crushed me. I would not, I would have been a basket case if I would have came back and would have saw. I just know I couldn't have handled it. As it is now, I can't go anywhere. I mean, if I want to rest, I got to go home. I can't be around people because when I see people, the only thing I'm thinking about is do you know the Lord Jesus? Do you know him? But I believe there are different capacities and compartments. I've read stories and uh, testimonies from Mary Kay Baxter and uh, Bill Weiss. Uh, Kenneth Hagin had an uh, experience with hell. Many, man, I, there are, if you go out on the Internet and you search, you research hell, you'd be surprised. I mean, there are so many testimonies about hell and the things that people saw. And uh, guys, I I don't believe people are going to make that up. I'm not going to stand. I'm a professional. I own a construction company. I have employees. I'm not going to. I don't have nothing to prove. This ain't about me. I don't want to come up here and sound like a flake. That ain't what I want to do. You know what? This ain't about me. I don't know why anybody would make something up like that. To stand before a congregation and say, hell is real and that I experienced this and and for it not to have happened, wow, I believe when people say they went to hell. I believe those testimonies. 
Why would somebody make that up? The Bible declares different aspects of hell as the cast out, separated from God, and total darkness. It declares, and there's even a part that Jesus talks about, he says, where the worm never dies. And I heard a testimony of a lady who actually experienced the worms. These worms, they go through the cavities of the beings, and they come in and out. They come out of your mouth. They come out of your ears. They come out of your nose. Um, Jesus even spoke about it in the gospel. He said, where the worm never dies. And, there, and what the testimony of this lady was that these worms would just eat, they would just enter and they would, God, can you imagine? My God, I can't stand a worm. I can't stand maggots. I mean, I hate them things. I mean, the worst thing for me would have been uh, if they would have put them little slugs. I hate them slugs, man. Them little slugs, they make, they make me mad. I manifest on them things. You know how you pour salt on them and they're like, <laughs> But well, I, that would have been like my worst hell for me if they would have had slugs come in. I, anyway, Psalm 86, 13, for great is thy mercy toward me. Thou has delivered my soul from the lowest hell. In just a moment, in that place of torment, in that place of utter despair and hopelessness, I heard these words, and I believe these to be the words of God. This is your last chance. This is your last chance. And it was said with so much authority and so much vigor. It was said in such a way that you knew it was daddy God and he wasn't playing. This is your last chance. I heard those words. This is your last chance. And immediately I came back to and I saw my wife. And then later, for some reason, Blake jumps on top of me. And he's like, in my face, what were you doing, dude? <laughs> he's like, I guess he's, he saw that. I mean, he's like trying to resuscitate me or whatever. But this is your last chance. You know, just those words alone, to think as a drug addict who messed up and fell back and turned back into sin so many times, how in the world am I going to go and not use drugs again. How could this be my, this is like that, y'all, this is like the Hail Mary. Y'all, I mean, it's like the flankers are going out. The only way I'm going to make it is if, I mean, this is fourth and, and, and like forever and with one second left on the clock. And you got to hit the Hail Mary to make it. That's how I'm feeling. This is your last chance. What do you, what do you mean, God? I don't get no more slips. God, that's it. It's over with. That's it. Wow, just that alone, that alone was enough. But I entered into the stage of what I call the aftermath of the moments to come. <laughs> By this time, I, well, when I came back to, this is a very important thing, I was screaming to the top of my lungs, screaming. John said she's never heard anything like that ever in her life. And I was screaming, get them off of me. Get them off, get them off, get them off of me. And I was fighting. She said, I was fighting the whole time. I was fighting. Like, even when I, go, it was like I was fighting. It was like I was fighting to live, y'all. I really was fighting with everything in me to not, I just knew that if I wouldn't fight, if I would have gave in to it, if I wouldn't have fought, it was like I knew what was going to happen. I would have never came back from that place. It would have been forever. It would have been over. And so I, I begin to scream that, get them off of me. And, I, and, and, and just, I, I'm screaming to her about hell is real. And by this time, the paramedics and the police are in my house. And I'm grabbing the cop and I'm saying, dude, hell is real. Hell is real. And the paramedics, and I'm saying, like, hell is real. And he's like, just count, just count. One, two, three, four. I'm like, dude, hell is real. And so the, I mean, I, I'm, everybody, I, I must have told 50 people. From the point where the paramedics got me to the emergency room, even called a judge on the phone and told him what happened to me. And he was really interested and wanted to know more. Um, and but then at, at one moment, Butch gets to the hospital, Pastor Butch, and uh, he's like, Kevin, shut up. They about to put you in a straitjacket. <laughs> and he's like, you don't get the chance to tell it. That's enough. 
But I had a little, one of the police officers, he, he sat at my bed for like two hours. And I, I just know that he believed what I told him. I know that he knew what I was saying was the truth. And he, and he just wouldn't leave. And he's just sitting there. And uh, I, I got to see him a, a few months later and, be, and just began to share with him. And I wanted to invite him to come tonight. I didn't, I, I mean today, and I didn't think about it. The, the following days, the next three days, um, I experienced, it was, it was very hard for me. When it got dark outside, I got very fearful because I had been in this place of darkness. I was so scared of the dark. I mean, I'm like, Sean, what are we going to do? It's getting dark. Put the shades up. Let's, I mean, I, I'm like, I, I couldn't go to the bathroom by myself. I was so afraid. I would have moments that I would just break out shaking. I would just get so scared thinking about hell and thinking about what just happened to me. Why? Why did God spare me? It scared me so much. And then, you know, the upcoming weeks, I would get around. I remember going to a restaurant, and this one waitress had come up to me to take my order. And I, I literally, when she walked up to me, I felt that that thing I felt breathing on me, I felt it in her. There was something in her, and I, and I wanted to throw up, and I felt sick. And so since that time, I've had all these, I mean, these phobias and, and just experiences with, with, I'm just not normal anymore. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just not. And I got to tell everybody about Jesus. I'm going to say a few scriptures about hell. 2 Samuel 22, 6, The sorrows of hell come past me about. The snares of death prevented me. Psalms 9, 17, The wicked shall be turned into hell. You ever heard that? The wicked shall be turned into hell. Proverbs 7, 27, Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs 15, 24, The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. A wise man thinks about eternity. Why is it that we as human beings and Americans, we prepare and we plan so much in this earth. We're planning for our children's scholarship. We're planning for our, we're making investments. And we're planning our little life out, but we don't plan for eternity. A wise man plans for eternity. I'm here to tell you. You need to get your insurance policy. You can ask Leslie a little bit about an insurance policy. You better have it, and it better say Jesus on the top. You better make sure you're going to the right place, because the place I experience, you don't want to go there. Isaiah 5, 14, therefore hell has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he who is jubilant shall descend into it. People shall be brought down, each man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. The Bible says in Isaiah 14, 9, Hell from beneath you is excited about you to meet you at your coming. Matthew 5, 29, And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Let me tell you how serious Jesus was about it. He said it'd be better for you to lose a limb, to lose an eye. If it's causing you to sin, a sin that you can't get out of, it would be better to cut your hand off than for your body and your whole existence to be thrown into hell. We need, to get, we need to get forceful and vengeful about sin in our own lives. That's what Jesus was saying. He's saying be extreme and be radical about sin in your life. He said because that sin will bring you to hell. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy the soul and the body in hell. God has all power. And what I'm looking at right now, I'm looking at a bunch of healthy bodies, 
but each person in here has a spirit man. And that spirit man is going to live forever in one place or the other. The Bible declares to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, indicating that there is no in-between place. There are many other scriptures that, that uh, signify that or exemplify that, but we are going to live eternally somewhere the rest of our lives. Where are you going to live? Will you hold on to the things you want above the things that God wants? How far will you let Jesus pry into your life? I think we know what things that besets us and keeps us from the fullness of God. You see, when you say yes to sin, you say no to Jesus. That's the fact of the matter. When you say yes to yourself, you say no to Jesus. It's not about me. It's noth it is nothing about me. I just want to live for the Lord. That's it. I want to live for him. Well, how do you know if you belong to Satan? How do you know if you have a contract agreement with him? 1 John 3, 8. Tim, put that on a board. 1 John 3, 8. Anybody have a Bible? 1 John 3, 8. All right, here we go. Pay attention, guys. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of of the devil. You want to know if where you are today, if you want to know if you have eternal life, if you want to know if hell has a contract with you, you ask yourself this question. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Why did God manifest? Why did Jesus manifest? Destroy. Destroy. To do what? To do what? Destroy. Destroy. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means that, that sin no longer has power over me. You see, there's something that came into me. There's a spirit. There's a, 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 a place in the Bible that talks about the born again experience where God himself, he touches your spirit and it comes alive. And when you become born again, you're activated inside. And at that moment, there's an acceleration. There's a there's an imputing of God's power into your spirit. Your spirit comes alive, and then what? Sin does not have dominion over me. I have the power to put sin down. That's what it means to be saved. For those of you who don't know what that means, to be saved means that I have now gained or ascertained the power of the Lord Jesus Christ through what he did. That's why God manifested his son and died on a cross to give us the power. He took sin into his body. He took sin on his own self. He said, I love creation so much. I love my children so much. I don't want any of them to die and go to hell. He said, I'll pay the price. I'll take the sin upon my back. I'll die for them, God. I'll turn your wrath away from them, God. I'll die on the cross to save some. The Bible says that if he be lifted up, he would draw all men unto him. How many men? All men, not some men, all men. Christ was lifted up and he, take, he took the burden and the penalty of sin upon him. And when you put your faith and your trust and your hope and your love into that, see, that's the, the law of reciprocity. It's that love shown. God so loved the world that he died and gave his only son. God so loved the world. That's the law of reciprocity. That's what causes me to overcome sin. It's because God... Showed his love while I was yet a sinner. God died for me. And I can't believe Jesus died for me. 
You know how I lived? I was a drug addict. And that blows me away that the king of all kings, the creator of the universe. You think President Bush or President Obama is going to die for me? But the king of all kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, he gave it all up. He said, I'll go and I'll save him and I'll give it to him in Jesus' name. Woo! That's the power of the cross. That's the power of the Lord Jesus. That's what all his fuss is about, y'all. It's about what he did. Wow. We serve an awesome God. His life for mine. His life for mine. Now, here's the thing. Let's just get a little bit on this sin thing a little bit. We're not willing to let go of some things that we think we like. We think we like them. We think. What I have found is the things that I was holding on to, those sins, those little foxes, those little things that I had to have, when I gave them to Jesus, I realized I didn't want them anyway. Because what he gave me in, ex in exchange far outweighs the filth and the mire and the muck that I was in. You see, I got his best, y'all. When I have a bad day at work, when I have things going on, I have a place I can go. It's called my prayer closet. And I can say, Lord Jesus, I have all day. Can you help me? And his love will fill my heart. I'm telling you, I'll feel his presence just like I'm talking to you guys right now. I'll feel him and he'll come. What a gift that the creator of the universe will encourage us. And, help. and you know what else the Lord has done? He's caused me to take the limits off. I, don't, I, I really don't have any fear. In me. I, I, with, with reference to business, who cares if I fail? I'm going all the way. You know what? He said I can do it, so I believe it, and I'm going to do it. Amen? If he is for me, who is against me? George is going to sing in a, in a little bit the mercy seat of God. And I'm going to pray today, if you got sin in your life, if you want to get right with God, You'll get your opportunity today. We wouldn't have a, a message like this. We wouldn't come and talk about the Lord Jesus and tell you about these great things and tell you that hell is real and tell you that if, if, if you don't repent, you're going to go to hell. We, we wouldn't be that evil of us. We want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus. We want to give you an opportunity to get things right in your own heart and in your own life. The Bible declares that today is the day of salvation. Why would you put it off another moment? You would rather hold on to what you have? I'm telling you, I'm testifying about hell. I'm testifying about the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would you want anything else? I am a living witness and a testimony right here standing up before you to tell you that God's power is real. Why would you want to hold on? And you guys who... You know, in, in my witnessing and talking to people, I realize that when you're talking to someone who, who's perhaps not a drug addict, perhaps doesn't have everything uh, going haywire in their life, they think they're okay. You know, they, but let me tell you something. Those are the hardest people to witness to because they don't realize they're in need of a Savior, just like the drug addict is in need of a Savior. There's no variation. Sin is sin. Don't try to measure sin. Sin in the sight of God is that there is no measurement of sin. He said with the, the ones that fell on the, on the Tower of Shalom in, in, the, um, in the book of Matthew, Jesus told him, he said, were, they, were their sins greater than the other ones? He said, if you don't repent, you're going to die and go to hell too. Because they were trying to say, well, these people, because they deserve that. They had a lot of sin in their life. But Jesus declared, he said, no, friend, no. If you don't repent, of the sin that you have in your heart, you are at risk of busting hell wide open. Father, we worship you. Jesus.